Hello, this is Tail, and welcome to Tail Talks. Today I'd like to talk to you about a little game called Ico. Now for those of you who don't know, Ico was a puzzle platformer developed by a group called Team Ico, and it was released on the PlayStation 2 in 2001. It was of course published by Sony, and uh, it managed to build itself quite a cult following over the years, despite the fact that it launched, no one really cared about it. There was no real marketing push, and no one really knew what it was. And it's a good thing too, that it did grab that cult following over time, which of course led to Shadow of the Colossus being a big deal when it was finally announced and released. Okay, so Ico was a game that I've heard nothing but good things about for a lot of years. Many, many years. I've had a lot of people recommend this game to me. And, uh, it's something that I never owned a PlayStation 2, so I never got to play it when it originally came out. But, uh, thankfully there was a HD re-release for the PlayStation 3 that also came bundled with Shadow of the Colossus, which I'll get to in a few weeks. And, um... I finally found the time to sit down and really play it, and I was really, really excited to play this game. It had a lot of things going for it that, to me, is a game I find very appealing. But unfortunately, the game didn't live up to my expectations, and I'll get into why. Now, I know not liking this game is kind of like a bit of a sacrilegious thing, and I just want to go out and say I did not dislike the game. I just didn't find it to be the amazing experience that I was hoping it would be. So uh, I hope you don't mind hearing me out. So of course, first of all I'd like to talk about all the positive things about this game that I found, and uh, thankfully there was actually quite a few of these. Now, one of the things I really liked about it was how minimal the story was. I find a lot of games now they tend to shove a lot of story in your face, and a lot of the time it's not all that interesting or that intelligent or well written. And Ico manages to kind of avoid this issue by keeping things incredibly simple. You're simply a guy with horns locked in a prison for reasons that you don't know as a player. You've got horns, so you just assume that it's probably got something to do with that. And after you escape your cell, you run into a girl called uh, Yorda, and you're simply just trying to escape that prison with her. And that's it. That's all the story is. And really, that's all it needs to be. And it works fantastically on that level. I wish there were more games that were happy just being that simple and... You know, uh, minimalism is a can be a very powerful tool, and it doesn't seem to be used in games all that often. And so I very much appreciated here and found it very, very refreshing. Likewise, there was something in the terms of minimalism that I kind of found frustrating, but kind of really appreciated at the same time, and that was the lack of a HUD. So of course, things have changed a lot since 2001 when this game was released, and HUDs are everywhere in almost every game now. And when I started playing this and realized that there wasn't a HUD, and there were no tutorials, I spent the first 40 minutes just trying to wrap my head around how the control works, and all of this was through trial and error. Of course, I could have consulted the manual, but no one ever checks the manual, as intelligent as that would be. And it's all things like holding down a button in order to activate a switch as opposed to just tapping it, that it took me a while to like wrap my head around. Now, I think at the time this game was released, that sort of thing was a little bit more acceptable. It was still, I wouldn't say early in the 3D development stage of video games, but it was still a pretty free time and people were still getting used to working these things out themselves. Whereas going back to this game now, after years and years of being babied by pretty much every game that's released, it's kind of jarring to not be told exactly what to do. And I appreciated it, but I also found it quite frustrating. And I don't think that's the game's fault so much as it is just the way games have evolved over the years. Something the stripped down approach did do very well was add to the atmosphere. Obviously not having a HUD, not having tutorials pop up um, as you're exploring this environment really makes it feel like a real place and it was incredibly immersive in that respect. And on that level, I very, very, very much appreciated that stripped down approach. Something else that I kind of appreciated in some ways, but it felt like a bit of a cop-out in other ways, was the way Yorda works. So, in order to get her to move around, you can either go to a place and you can hold down a button which uh, gets Iko to call Yorda over to you, and when you do that you'll see that her pathfinding is pretty average at best. So what they've done is they've given you the ability, and this is something that should be in a lot of escort missions in games since, but hasn't been, but you can actually grab onto, their, onto Yorda's hand and actually pull her around. So basically by controlling Iko, you're controlling her. And uh, I do love the fact that you are just controlling Iko, you're not controlling the two as one unit. It's very much whatever you do to Iko will uh, actually pull her arm around and you will see her struggling to keep up with you. And I appreciate it on that level. I will say that they integrated this mechanic fantastically, but really the pulling Yorda around felt more like a... they were circumventing the issue of pathfinding. 
which considering the power of the PlayStation 2 and how early the technology was at that time, is understandable that the pathfinding would be rather poor. But uh, it feels like they were trying to cover that up. But, and I do want to make this, this is a very important but, the way they visually convey pulling her around almost makes up for that fact. It does look genuine the way Igo pulls her around, and it's actually quite amazing in that respect. So maybe that ability was always going to be there, maybe it wasn't about pathfinding, but that's just how it felt to me, like watching her try to make her way to ladders and things like that. So I very much appreciated the way they covered it up, if that is indeed what their intention was. But there were a lot of times where I just wanted to explore a little bit and then have her come to me and it just, watching her try to make her way, kind of frustrating. The uh, pacing for the game also feels very, very natural. So basically each room is its own individual puzzle. Other games have, have uh, done this since and I always appreciate games that do this. Um, but basically, like, yeah, you're in this uh, prison and you're trying to escape and each room of that is kind of like a puzzle. I guess Legend of Zelda does that a lot too. Legend of Zelda, you tend to find that there's a more, few more puzzles where you do something in one room and it might affect another room. Iku doesn't really have that. It's very much, you're in this particular zone that it's loaded, and whatever you do in that zone will affect that zone exclusively. And this is a, uh, outside of uh, opening the gates at the end of the game, which is a pretty simple puzzle in itself. But generally, when you solve a puzzle in a room, it affects that room exclusively. And this makes it, this one puzzle at a time sort of mentality kind of makes it feel like the pacing uh, works well in that regard. It, it's like the ball rolling constantly and it feels really good like that. And I really, really appreciated the pacing of the game in that respect. And it's uh, beautifully, beautifully done. Also, the sound design was really, really refreshing. There's very little music. Um, I think there's, there's a little bit of music at the opening title, I think. And there's music when you're fighting these shadow creatures, which is very repetitive and kind of sounds really digital and odd and it works really well. And there's an absolutely beautiful song over the end credits. And that's pretty much it in terms of music. The rest of it's all just ambient sound design. And it sounds absolutely beautiful. When you're inside the prison, it's just dull, muffled ambience. And when you're outside, you can hear the breeze blowing and birds. And it's it just sounds fantastic. And uh, I really, really appreciate the amount of detail that went into the sound design of this game. I think it's really, really impressive. But really, that's where the positive things for this game sort of started running out for me. Uh, there's the combat, which is incredibly simple and repetitive. And some of the fights feel like they literally go on forever. Now, I think this was a design choice. This wasn't just them not knowing how long to make the battles go on for. I think they wanted these battles to drag. And uh, they did that on purpose. And be that as it might be, it didn't make it fun for me as the player, personally. I can understand other people might enjoy it, but it really didn't work for me in that respect. And uh, there are some flying enemies, specifically, which I found incredibly frustrating and annoying to fight. Once again, I think it was a deliberate design choice to make these guys annoying. You kind of have to jump in the air and swing the stick or your sword, and it just feels kind of awkward. And I think the reason they did it was because Aiko, obviously, he's just a kid. He's not, a, he's not an amazing fighter or anything like that. And so you're feeling his pain. He's not hes not a great fighter, and so the game kind of feels clunky playing it in that regard. And that's fine that they've done that, but that doesn't make it fun. And so I guess that's a decision that you have to make. When you have an artistic vision, do you sacrifice some of the fun or vice versa in that respect? And they've decided to savor the artistic expression, which is fine for them that they, that they did that but for me personally i kind of would have preferred if it was just a little bit tighter and maybe some of those action sequences or combat sequences didn't drag on as long as they do something that was an artistic decision and did bug me was the camera there are quite a few times particularly later on in the game where there are platforming sequences where i would just jump to my death because the camera made it look like i was going to make a jump and i wouldn't and it's very limited with what you can do with the camera in terms of making it rotate this was, I believe, done so that the camera doesn't get stuck in the environment or on the geometry of the environment around Ico, so you can really only move it in specific areas, but sometimes they're not really all that helpful in terms of platforming segments. And it can also look quite flat uh, in some areas where the camera will sit there. There was one particular moment later, uh, towards the end of the game where I had to jump onto a giant wheel which had some uh, little posts sticking out of it. And I thought I was lined up with them, and it really looked like I was lined up with these posts and I was jumping, but I was actually too far back, and so the camera didn't really allow me to see where I was in relation to those. And the camera stopped in a really specific spot, so it was obviously pre-programmed to sit in this particular area. 
And uh, that sort of thing I found kind of frustrating. In fact, it was very frustrating, and a lot of the immersion that the game had built up until that point was actually destroyed by that sequence because of the bad platforming and bad camera. And uh, something else that kind of bugged me as well in that respect was the way the checkpoints worked. You can There's a checkpoint every time you sit down in this seat to save, which is fine, that makes sense. And also every time that Yorta opens up one of these uh, doors with this symbol, it will also do a checkpoint there. But uh, some of these puzzle sequences can take up to 15 to 20 minutes to of like a sequence of events that you have to take and if you happen to fall to your death because the camera is not working the way you want it to you have to replay that 15 to 20 minutes and that kind of also broke any immersion every time that happened which is very very unfortunate in a game like this which is so immersion heavy ultimately to sum up my experience with Ico there's not really that much more I can go into without spoiling it I do think it's a game that everybody should experience at least once if they're serious about gaming. And so, to really sum up Ico in as few words as possible, I would have to say that Ico is a game that I have a deep appreciation and respect for. It's unprecedented in a lot of ways, and I absolutely love what it was trying to do and what it accomplished. But unfortunately, all those positives weren't enough to make me love the game. I really wanted to love Ico, I really did. It did so many things that just, I wish game designers would apply more often, but it just didn't quite make it. And I didn't enjoy playing it as much as I wanted it to. And I actually found myself enjoying it less and less the more I played it, because the camera issues and other little issues became more and more apparent. So, do I recommend Ico? Yes I do. I recommend that you play it at least once, on either the PS2 or I would definitely recommend the HD re-release on the PlayStation 3. But for me personally, despite the artistic integrity behind it, Ico is not the classic game that I wish it was, or that a lot of people told me it was. That said, Shadow of the Colossus, whole other story, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But until then, let me know about your experiences with Ico, and if you agree or disagree with me on any of these points in the comments below. Don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Thanks for your time, this has been Tail Talks, and I'll see you next time.